This hour on I-24 News, in Syria, aid groups say the death toll involving children killed this week in eastern Ghouta now stands at more than 100. And amidst the airstrikes, the United Nations still has not been able to agree on a ceasefire. The United States says it's hitting North Korea with the heaviest sanctions yet, this time targeting shipping companies and other firms that help fund North Korea's nuclear program. And U.S. officials say the American embassy in Israel will move to Jerusalem within three months. That's a lot sooner than anybody in the region had expected. From the I-24 News Studios in Times Square in New York, this is Crossroads with David Schuster and Tal Heinrich. This has been another day of horrific violence in Syria and another day of confusion at the United Nations. Once again, the UN remains deadlocked over a resolution that might call for a month-long ceasefire in eastern Ghouta. Hundreds of thousands of people continue to suffer as the UN Security Council unsuccessfully negotiated urgently needed access for humanitarian aid and medical evacuations. The death toll from a solid week of airstrikes has now soared to well over 450, including more than 100 dead children. For more, let's bring in senior diplomatic correspondent Nina Larson at the UN headquarters. Nina, are you keeping track how many times has this vote been postponed? What's going on at the Security Council today? Very good question. Tell everyone is tremendously frustrated here. This vote was postponed from yesterday. It's been postponed about three or four times today. Now we're told to expect a vote no matter what. Uh, no matter which way it goes tomorrow at noon here at the United Nations. It's very unusual uh, for the Security Council to come in over a weekend. It's very unusual for something like this to stretch out so long. But we're really seeing a moment of truth here for the United Nations and for Syria. There's tremendous pressure on Russia at the moment. Obviously, they are the, the veto capable power that is holding this back at the moment. Uh, there have been phone calls all over the world uh, to Vladimir Putin. Uh, Macron and Merkel called him earlier today to pressure him into passing this resolution. That still hasn't happened yet. We've had statements from the European Union and from Turkey and, uh, you know, pressure from the United States as well, obviously. But Russia simply won't budge at the moment. And what is it that the Russians don't like about this possible resolution? That's a good question as well, David. Uh, yesterday, it appeared that the question was all about certain caveats that the Russians wanted regarding a ceasefire not including groups like ISIS and any Al-Qaeda-affiliated groups like the Al-Nusra Front in that area. But now we're being told uh, late today that it's really coming down to one paragraph. What they're objecting to now is this notion of a 30-day long ceasefire. Uh, the, the diplomats that were coming out of uh, the meeting or the various meetings that went on all day today say that they're very, very close. But you could see the looks on people's faces. They look absolutely exhausted and extremely frustrated. Well, a very dramatic day there at the UN Security Council. But on the ground in Syria, Nina, what's taking place? Well, it's just as bad as ever, Tal, and uh, one development is the Syrian Air Force has been dropping leaflets uh, to the civilian population in eastern Ghouta, that very critical area, encouraging them to hand themselves over to the Syrian army and promising them safe passage. Uh, but the rebels in eastern Ghouta actually wrote to the Security Council saying they are not going to contemplate this. This is exactly the kind of tactics we saw from the Syrian army uh, over Aleppo uh, just 18 months ago, where rebels Rebels were encouraged to just give up their stronghold there after being starved out and bombed out. So very critical time at the moment. It is possible, one school of thought, is that Russia is simply buying more time for the Assad regime to finish the job. Anina, the Assad regime has had some tactical success with this bomb them into submission tactic in the past, right? Yes, that's right. Uh, Aleppo and certain other rebel-held areas. This is a very critical area for them strategically. It's one of the last rebel strongholds. It's very close to Damascus. And the rebels there have been able to hit certain areas in Damascus with artillery. But they can't stand up much further against the might of the Syrian air force 
and the Russian Air Force, David. Nina Larson, our senior diplomatic correspondent covering the events in the United Nations. Nina, thank you. Let's now bring in E.J. Kimball, a security analyst at the Middle East Forum. And E.J., what do you make of the U.N.'s inability to agree on a basic ceasefire given all of the suffering that has happened this week and they can't come together and agree on language? Yeah, well, well first, thanks for having me on. And, and, you know, this really just goes to show, unfortunately, the ineptitude of the, the United Nations, the U.N. Security Council's inability to act. And this is a direct result of President Obama turning over the uh, chemical weapons issue to the Russians. Russia now has control in Syria to prop up the Assad regime. I and actually thought this was a direct result of this. Well, I actually thought this was a direct result of the Syrian regime deciding to bomb into submission civilians. I mean, fine, you can make the argument that the Obama administration may have been weak, but can you detect what the Trump administration policy is in Syria? Well, that's that's the challenge right now. Uh, after defeating ISIS, uh, removing its strongholds. This was the question I think I addressed almost a year ago on this show, was now what? Where are we going to go forward on, on Syria? What's our strategy? And right now, this is being controlled by the Russians. Uh, and the Iranians are, are involved in, in Syria, and there's, there's protection going on. And, and it's a humanitarian crisis that, quite frankly, should never have happened. And the United Nations Security Council needs to do something, and the Russian government needs to start playing ball. But let me ask you this, even if a ceasefire is, you know, trying to be implemented, how can we follow through as the United Nations, as Western countries, the international community? Because once the rebels start shooting, the Syrian army will respond. Right. Well, this is why we actually need a plan to end this conflict. You know, it's, it's interesting how uh, the Syrian regime is, you know, unremittingly uh, targeting civilian areas and essentially the world isn't doing anything yet you know when you have Israel trying to warn Palestinians uh, because Hamas is firing rockets at Israeli civilians to get out of the way and they're keeping them hostage the United Nations very quickly is willing to act uh, on uh, crises that aren't actually uh, crises being caused by by the Israelis so you know right now you're hundred percent correct once there's there's a shot fired and no matter who shoots it the other side will blame it and that's the problem that we have is there is no strategy in place there is no end game that we have articulated as to what we want to see in syria and right now what we're looking at is an iranian regime that's gaining more and more influence the assad regime which is on the verge of retaking all of the the Damascus and greater Damascus area and without doing something uh, drastic to change the circumstances on the ground we're eventually going to be back to where we were uh, before the civil war started is there anything EJ that the United States can do vis-a-vis -vis Russia in terms of pressuring them or somehow trying to encourage the Russians to step up beyond just the phone calls to Putin in terms of this UN resolution putting the UN out of this because of their ineptitude as you say what about though is there something specific the United States can do to try to get Russia to take some sort of action well there, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of activity going on um, between the United States and Russia obviously on a whole host of issues which complicates the matter uh, President Trump's a deal maker and I, I guess the uh, the the best case scenario is that aside from the uh, you know the Russian interference in our election to sort of separate those issues out and make a deal with the Russians to end this uh, you know, bombing and humanitarian uh, catastrophe going on. I don't know specifically what they can do. Um, you know, un unfortunately, the world doesn't seem ready to act. Words alone are not gonna change things. Um, action needs to be, be um, implemented to do something, and the world at the moment is, is standing back and essentially kowtowing to the Russians and allowing the Syrian regime to continue. E.J. Kim, Kimball, security analyst at the Middle East Forum, thank you for joining us this evening. And we're thank staying you. in Syria. This March marks the seventh anniversary of the start of the civil war, and there is no end in sight to the government's brutality or the people's suffering. Adding to the carnage is the Syrian government's use of chemical weapons. I-24 News correspondent Daniel Tsemach has that story. 
Seven years of carnage, a conflict so bloody that it is difficult to exaggerate or even adequately describe, characterized by destroyed cities, a refugee crisis, and human tragedy, and potentially more sinister than anything else, the repeated use of chemical weapons. Over the first few years, civilian casualties quickly became commonplace, and soon, reports of chemical weapons used against helpless civilians started to surface, prompting a memorable announcement by then U.S. President Barack Obama. We cannot have a situation where chemical or biological weapons are falling into the hands of the wrong people. Uh, we have been very clear to the Assad regime, but also to other players on the ground that a red line for us is we start saying a whole bunch of chemical weapons moving around or being utilized. But it was only a matter of time. The war began to show its ugliest consequences. August 21, 2013, bombs containing sarin gas were dropped in eastern Ghouta, killing at least 500 and over 100 children, according to Syrian Human Rights Observatory. The world was outraged. A UN investigative team determined that sarin gas was used. In September 2013, the U.S. and Russia agreed to eliminate chemical weapons in Syria, a process that continued well into 2014. It made headlines, but doesn't seem to have solved anything. As chlorine gas has been reportedly used before 2013 and well after. Fast forward to 2017. Warplanes bombarded Syria's northern Idlib province, again with sarin gas. Dozens of civilians were killed in the rebel-held town. All signs pointed to Syria as the perpetrator, but this time, the response was different. The U.S. launched 59 Tomahawk missiles at the Syrian airbase The U.S. officials claimed the warplanes were sent from. A U.N. mandate aimed at determining the culprit of the chemical weapons attack was supported by several world powers, but, as has been the case time and time again, a Russian veto at the U.N. Security Council. Some might have seen the war coming to an end. But seven years later, the fighting continues, and the West's reaction seems unchanged. When international red lines are drawn, including over the unlawful use of chemical weapons, then once those red lines are crossed, there is credible response from the international community. Even now, the red lines continue to be crossed. The Israeli military claims that Assad still has chemical weapons and those that are far more dangerous than chlorine. Daniel Tzemach, I-24 News. David, you've been working in the news industry for over seven years, which means you were sitting in different news studios reporting about this war for seven years. We can be sitting here five years from now, you know, talking about the same number as 500 people, 100 kids. That's insane. It's, it's insane and it's remarkable because you think back, I mean, in addition to the chemical weapons, and chemical weapons haven't been used as, as we saw in the piece, it's been, they've been used repeatedly, right? And so never mind the use of chemical weapons, which prompted a cruise missile attack. You have the Trump administration whose standing policy is the Assad regime must go, and there's the regime bombing civilian areas. And there's no response. There's no military action. It's as if the Trump administration is somehow afraid, well, maybe if you take out the Assad regime, you strengthen the rebels, maybe then you somehow do strengthen al-Qaeda-related groups. We, I get that it's complicated, but it feels like inaction is not the answer. And I think we need to stop maybe talking about Syria as a country right now, because right. we keep saying a country, but, but it's not a country right now. You have the Turks in Afrin and also in Idlib, and, and, and the Russians setting the tones, the rebels. I guess my big question is, and, and this is something I guess maybe to explore down the road, are these images getting into Moscow? I mean, the images of the children and the, the fathers grieving over their dead children, or is the Russian media just not showing that because of Russia's role? And, and because I got to imagine that any human being is going to react a certain way to this, but maybe they're just not seeing it in Moscow. Maybe there's just, there's just no concern. Yeah, but even us watching these images every day at a certain point, you know, it's yeah, just... it's rough. It's been seven years. Well... Coming up on Crossroads, President Trump just announced what he called the heaviest ever sanctions on North Korea. It's the United States' latest bid to pressure the regime over its nuclear program. It comes as the United States and South Korea get ready to resume joint military exercises in an effort to keep up their defenses against the North.
President Trump has revealed that the United States is imposing new sanctions on North Korea, reportedly the toughest yet. In its latest bid to pressure the regime over its nuclear program, this round of economic restrictions targets shipping and trading companies. The president announced his plans at the end of a lengthy speech on this day at the Conservative Political Action Conference, or CPAC. And frankly, hopefully something positive can happen. We will see. But that just was announced, and I want to let you know, we have imposed the heaviest sanctions ever imposed. The president's announcement came while his daughter, Ivanka, was dining with South Korean President Moon Jae-in in Seoul. Hi, thank you for hosting us all here tonight as we reaffirm our bonds of friendship, of cooperation, of partnership, and reaffirm our commitment to our maximum pressure campaign to ensure that the Korean Peninsula is good for us. The first daughter arrived in Seoul, the South Korean capital, on Friday to attend this weekend's closing ceremony of the Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang. A North Korean delegation is also expected to attend the closing ceremony. The Trump administration is downplaying the possibility of Ivanka Trump interacting with any of the northern regime delegates. However, the State Department confirms that at the beginning of the Olympics, Vice President Pence was ready to meet with the North's delegation, but the North allegedly canceled the meeting. Meantime, the U.S. and South Korea are set to resume joint military exercises after the Winter Olympics. The two countries agreed to put the annual drills on hold after North and South Korea announced they were communicating for the first time in two years. The exercises usually draw a fierce response from North Korea, at least rhetorically. During last year's drills, Pyongyang launched multiple missile tests and held a massive artillery exercise. A South Korean defense official has said that despite this year's delay, the drills will not be scaled back. For more on the tensions along the Korean Peninsula, we're joined by international security analyst Martin Himmel. And Martin, would it be a good idea for Ivanka Trump to just meet with the northern delegation just to reiterate, hey, here are the sanctions that are coming unless you start to scale back your nuclear program? I think talk is much better than fighting. Uh, and I think even the Trump administration would say that. The question is, what's the venue of the talk? What's the purpose of the talk? What are the parameters of the talk? And right now, it seems that the North Koreans and the United States haven't quite agreed to that. It seems most of the focus of the North Koreans is try to actually woo the South Koreans by getting them more amenable to their approach. They hope the South Koreans put more pressure on the United States, hoping the United States will ease its pressure on the North. But what do you think will happen now when after the Winter Olympics will be over? All the appearance of diplomacy, small breakthroughs, is it all over? No, I don't think it's over. I actually, I, I believe in the next month or two, uh, there's going to be a summit meeting between the president of North Korea, uh, South Korea and the chairman of North Korea. Really? Uh, yes, and that's, that's in the works. It's definitely in the works. That was announced uh, a little while ago. And uh, that's not the first time they've met before in, in the past. But the fact that they meet is key. And I actually think that one of the reasons Trump is ratcheting up the, the uh, sanctions is basically to say, well, meet, talk, it's good, but we're keeping this very tough pressure on you until there's some sort of result. Would this summit meeting happen before the military exercises? Oh, I don't think they're really connected. It's supposed to be in the spring at some stage. Uh, and it's, again, not something that's unprecedented. It's happened many times in the past. It's good that it's happening now. Uh, the, I, I've, I've met with the North Koreans. I've been to North Korea. Really? I know their mindset. I know uh, the way they think. So how and, do they think about things like sanctions or the sort of very tough posture? Well, you have to understand, in their mind, they are absolutely convinced that uh, the United States is out to destroy them. It's just a part of the 1950 war that's continuing to this day, and they won't stop at anything. That's what the North really feels. And where they feel they could stop them is by the ability to attack the United States. After all, when they look what Muammar Gaddafi was the head of Libya, he made a deal not to make nuclear uh, weapons, and Hillary Clinton basically stabbed him in the back. And so that's another reason why they don't trust the United States. Not that they're right, but they do have their concerns. And so uh, that's their best guarantee. The United States will not bring regime change to Pyongyang. So what's your personal view, Martin, about the way the United States is handling this nuclear threat? What, Actually, do you think I've... sanctions are effective enough? I think, I think the sanctions, uh, well, they haven't been effective because they don't really have the right. Chinese and the Russians on board. <laughs> These sanctions to try to prevent the Chinese and the Russians through a black market system of bringing oil and coal 
to uh, North Korea. The ships are supposed, to, these ships have been secretly meeting in the sea, transferring it. They're trying to stop that. But frankly speaking, they won't completely stop it. I don't even think they want to completely stop it. They want to trouble it. But the president it. said if the sanctions don't work, there will be a phase two. Yes, well, he's talking very tough, but no one's going to go to war. No one's going to go to war with North Korea. If they go to war with North Korea, North Korea doesn't have to put, uh, doesn't have to uh, launch atomic bombs. They have thousands of artillery pieces just 50 kilometers, 50 miles from Seoul, and they can cause unimaginable damage just by doing that. So no one's going to go to war. It's a lot of talk. The question is, will they reach some sort of modus vivendi about the nuclear arsenal? You're calming us. Is there, no, <laughs> give, given the intractable positions, yeah. right? You've got the North Koreans who, for now, they're not going to give up their nukes, right? Because the United States has 28,000 troops and whatnot in South right. Korea. Is there any chance that the South Koreans would ever agree and say, okay, we'll tell the Americans to leave if you, the North Koreans, give up your nukes? No way. They don't want. They don't want the Americans to leave. They want the American nuclear weapons very close at hand. They want, but what they really want to do is defuse the tension. They don't honestly believe that Kim is going to get rid of his nuclear weapons. He's had nuclear weapons for quite a while already. His father so brought the in South Koreans weapons. are accepting of the idea that he will have nuclear weapons. Right, and but that's they just want to reality. defuse the tension and they want to resume trade. There's a lot of trade that's been going on through these countries. Hyundai had operations, has operations in North Korea. They want to continue it. But, uh, they, but it's been really suspended by all this trouble. They want to have relations. They want to have something going on. The last thing they want, by the way, is for North Korea to collapse because they don't want 30 million North Koreans coming to the south. So they want to defuse the tension. That's what they want. Martin Himmel, thank you so much thank for you. coming here saying there will be no war with North Korea. <laughs> I think that's the most positive note. If right. not, interview. we're bringing you back here and yelling at <laughs> okay. you or something like that. <laughs> Thank you so much. And still ahead on Crossroads, the United States has announced plans to move its embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem as early as May, marking Israel's 70th birthday. Plus, the plan won't be loved by either side, and it won't be hated by either side, but it's a template to start talking. U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations Nikki Haley says a proposal for a long-awaited peace plan in the Middle East is close to completion. We now have a better idea about when the United States Embassy in Israel will move from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, and the official word is that this move will happen in May. And despite the move sparking Palestinian outrage, the Trump administration is now saying a peace plan proposal is nearly complete. I-24 News correspondent Marcus White has the details. The U.S. plans to move its embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem May 14th. A ribbon-cutting ceremony is planned for mid-May. The opening will coincide with the 70th anniversary of Israeli independence. The nation declared independence on May 14th, 1948. Details about the move come more than two months after President Trump made an announcement declaring Jerusalem as Israel's capital. <laughs> President Trump's declaration sparked outrage and protests around the globe. <laughs> Palestinians in the Gaza Strip burned American and Israeli flags in protest of the announcement. The new embassy will initially be located inside a consulate facility already operating in Jerusalem. It's opening on an accelerated timetable. Warm hospitality. Vice President Mike Pence had said the embassy would open at the end of 2019. U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson said it could take years. President Trump is considering an offer from Republican billionaire Sheldon Adlison to pay for at least part of the new embassy. Administration officials say lawyers with the State Department are seeing if it's legal to accept private donations to cover some or all of the costs, which could be hundreds of millions of dollars. I think they're finishing it up. I mean, I, they're still going back and forth. But the Meanwhile, the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, Nikki Haley, says the Trump administration's proposal for peace is nearly finished. It's what... Israel and the Palestinian Authority decides they want. They're going to have to decide borders. They're going to have to decide property. They're going to have to The ambassador also people. says White House senior advisor Jared Kushner and Mideast envoy Jason Greenblatt will continue to be negotiators between Israel and the Palestinians. Haley was questioned Thursday at an event in Chicago moderated by David Axelrod, the former senior advisor to President Barack Obama. The plan won't be loved by either side, and it won't be hated by either side, but it's a template to start talking. Haley says she believes both sides are pushing for a two-state solution. I do have hope. I do have faith because 
The Palestinians deserve better and the Israelis deserve better. There's no word on when the peace plan will be complete. Marcus White, I-24 News. Been waiting for that U.S. peace plan literally ever since December when they announced that they would move the embassy and so many people around the world said, okay, where's the plan? There was a lot of anticipation on both yeah. sides, but um, it will be interesting to see what the plan will be and also the timing. Uh, what if on the day they move the embassy, they will release the peace plan? You know what? Plan, it, you know? <laughs> it may not be such a bad idea to do it around that time and to say, look, you know, as part of, as we've been saying all along, the final borders for Jerusalem, that's up to discussions and debate. We're just moving our embassy to West Jerusalem and that's that. I don't know. Well, We'll have to see. Yeah, still to come. In Washington, former Trump campaign aide Rick Gates just pleaded guilty to conspiracy and lying to investigators. He is now the fourth associate of President Trump to cooperate with special counsel Robert Mueller. And on this day, President Trump doubled down on his push to arm teachers with guns, claiming an armed teacher would have shot the hell out of the Florida school shooter. President Trump's former campaign manager, Paul Manafort, has been charged again. Manafort has been accused of allegedly recruiting and funding former European politicians to lobby for a pro-Russian government in Ukraine. That indictment comes as Manafort's business partner, Rick Gates, has now pleaded guilty to conspiracy and lying to investigators in the special counsel's probe into Russia's alleged meddling in the 2016 election. Tara Palmieri has the latest. Today, President Trump's former campaign aide, Rick Gates, pled guilty to conspiracy and false statement charges, signaling that he's ready to cooperate with special counsel Robert Mueller. Before arriving at a federal courthouse in D.C. today, he wrote a letter to friends and family saying, quote, I have had a change of heart. His guilty plea comes one day after he and his partner, former Trump campaign manager Paul Manafort, were indicted on 32 counts, including tax evasion and bank fraud. These charges are in addition to those filed against both men in October. They pled not guilty to those earlier charges. Gase is the latest Trump insider to strike a plea deal in Mueller's investigation into Russia's meddling in the 2016 election. Gates wrote, quote, the reality of how long this legal process will likely take, the cost, and the circus-like atmosphere of an anticipated trial are too much. Gates and Manafort were charged with funneling $75 million into offshore accounts and then not paying taxes on $30 million of those funds. These crimes were alleged to have taken place when the two men were working on the Trump campaign and lobbying for pro-Russian Ukrainian politicians. The two men lived lavishly. According to the indictment, they spent half a million dollars shopping in Beverly Hills, $200,000 on four Range Rovers, and $800,000 in landscaping. And that was Tara Palmieri reporting. Let's bring in our senior Washington correspondent, Dan Revive, and our senior national correspondent, Michael Shore. And Michael, I want to start with you because in my years of covering special counsels, independent counsels, if they indicted somebody repeatedly and in different venues, like they've indicted Paul Manafort in Washington, then they've indicted him in Virginia, then back in Washington, it's usually when they don't do it all at once, hey, you better cooperate with us, or guess what's coming on Friday? Is that what we're seeing play out? Hey, you're seeing Friday today in a big way with a big exclamation point, David. Yes, I mean, that could be what's, co what's, what's coming around here. One of the sort of surprising details that emerged today, for me anyway, David, is that the fact that, that Rick Gates actually lied even while he was first striking a deal with Robert Mueller uh, during the initial investigation. So he had to come clean on that, and then he's coming clean on this. And, of course, people are asking me, well, well how does that piece with, with Donald Trump? There are any you know, number of ways that you can take take your imagination here. But but yes, I, to go to your question, David, absolutely. I think that the, the furtherance of this indictment, getting Gates to, to uh, cooperate with this right now, means that things are not looking good for Manafort. And if Manafort has something with this money, this hidden money uh, that involves Donald Trump, you know, perhaps having been part to laundering this money, hiding it from the election officials, and then, of course, hiding it uh, from his own taxes, that's a problem. Dan, how can this Gates pleading guilty now change the dynamics of the investigation in your view? Well, Tal, it certainly puts pressure on Paul Manafort because Manafort and Gates, they did business together for a really long time and they served on the Trump campaign for a while. 
in 2016 with Manafort as the campaign chair. It's been noted, by the way, that Manafort did not want to be paid, apparently wasn't paid by the Trump campaign. But at the same time, in all these charges against Manafort, and he claims he's innocent, by the way, uh, he seems to be scrambling for money, trying to get bank loans, supposedly fraudulently, and of course, trying to make money and hide money overseas. So what's that about? Why was Manafort willing to work for the Trump campaign for free? Could it have been possibly people connected with Russia trying to get close to the Trump campaign? And again, Republicans are saying that doesn't mean Donald Trump did anything wrong, or even Donald Trump Jr., Jared Kushner, or others who had some meetings and some contacts with Russians. The mystery continues, but I'll tell you this. The independent counsel, the prosecutor, Robert Mueller, he knows a lot more than we do, Tal and David. And Dan, what was the reaction at, uh, at the White House on this day to this latest round of, uh, of charges? According to my count, uh, Manafort's now facing, see, 32 plus 12 plus 5. I think that's 49 <laughs> different criminal charges against him. Hmm. The White House staff finds this to be irrelevant. I mean, it is said uh, by Ty Cobb, who's working uh, on the White House staff uh, for President Trump on these matters, the lawyer Ty Cobb, uh, that this has nothing to do with Donald Trump and nothing to do with the Trump campaign. That's been said about this new set of charges against Manafort, and now Rick Gates pleads guilty. So people close to Trump say that does not worry them because it doesn't concern Donald Trump. They are sticking with that story, Tal and David. Mm -hmm. Michael Shore, it also means that the investigation is not going to end probably anytime soon with uh, 22 people so far and entities uh, that have been charged by the special counsel. Do you have any idea, maybe any guess who might be next? <laughs> I'd love, uh, I, I would make a, a lot of money if I was able to guess exactly who would be next. All. Uh, but no, I don't. I mean, I think that the attention in the White House now or attention from Mueller is going to keep being pointed toward uh, associates of Donald Trump. And by that, I think Jared Kushner is somebody that they are talking to and about. Uh, people that I've spoken to, and again, it doesn't matter who I've spoken to because nobody really knows. This seems like a very airtight, uh, maybe the most airtight investigation I remember, uh, are saying that, yes, that, that Jared Kushner is somebody that they are very interested in. And today, even uh, Donald Trump said that John Kelly is going to be the one who makes the call on whether or not Kushner has this uh, top secret uh, security clearance. And if that's the case, if there's a distancing even from the president and his son in law and again this is all part of the palace intrigue uh, if that's happening then yes maybe there's a sense that uh, that jared kushner is the next person that robert Mueller is looking at Hey, Michael, I wonder if one of the things that's uh, starting to settle in on Washington is usually at the beginning of investigations, there's a sort of a joint defense agreement that all the defense lawyers get together and say, OK, let's share information about who's going to the grand jury and who's being indicted and what information may be given up. At this point, with so many different people who have pled guilty, four different people who have agreed to cooperate, Gates has changed lawyers, it's got to be somewhat overwhelming for the president's team to try to keep track of all of this. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great point. And I think it's one of the headlines or the lower headlines of this whole uh, Rick Gates uh, you know, pleading guilty. He does have a lawyer who is not part of that, let's call it a fraternity for lack of a better word. And that means that exactly what's at, what, what you just said, David, is that this changes the dynamic of the joint defense of all of these people uh, that are being targeted by the Mueller investigation. And that is uh, often how a lot of these investigations change course, because when you break with what's happening and you see somebody split away from it, it, it can leave everything in tatters for those who are the defendants, David. Dan Revive, the president had a pretty busy day today. He touched on the gun control issue a couple of times, first at the CPAC convention and then at a shared press conference with Australian Prime Minister, which is interesting because Australia is the country that banned guns about 22 years ago. Um, how did the rhetoric change between these two events? Well, to go from the beginning to the end, in fact, when he was leaving the White House, he had a few remarks to reporters there. For instance, he branded as a coward the sheriff's deputy in Florida who did not enter the school, though the sheriff's deputy was armed and there was gunfire inside, okay? And then he goes to the CPAC conference and speaks not for 40 minutes as scheduled, but for an hour and 15 minutes and just goes on ad-libbing like it's a campaign uh, event. The conservatives absolutely loved it. And his main thing about guns, there should be armed teachers in the schools. Trump did not back away from that. Then at the White House, he's a diplomat again. He meets with Australia's Malcolm Turnbull. He and the Prime Minister stand, answer a few questions at a news conference. No major news, no surprises. They're getting along, but the Australians actually are concerned. Trump 
boasted about how friendly he is with China and expressed no concern about China's military building those islands in the South China Sea. Australia was trying to get Trump's attention on that. Trump said all he really cares about is trade. Colin Davis. Mm. On the issue of guns, it's so interesting to hear the president among the issues that among the things he's put out there is that he wants to possibly raise the age requirement. And there was the governor of Florida on this day, Rick Scott, a Republican who also stepped in front of the microphones and essentially broke with the NRA on that issue. Watch. Yes, we will yes. require all individuals purchasing firearms to be 21 or older. We will establish enhanced criminal penalties for threats to schools, like social media threats of shootings or bombings. We'll also enhance penalties if any person possesses or purchases a, purchases a gun after they have been deemed by state law to not have access to a gun. And we will completely ban the purchase or sale of bump stocks. Michael, on the age requirement, uh, how big a deal is this uh, politically for Rick Scott to break from the NRA? Well, it matters if Rick Scott is going to run for Senate against Bill Nelson, which was rumored and talked about uh, in depth. As a matter of fact, he said by March 9th, he would make a decision about that. That was, of course, before the Parkland shooting. So if it is something that he is still considering doing, it was clear, I think, after the other night in, in, in Parkland or in, in that area when they had the town hall, uh, a town hall that Rick Scott did not show up for, that he was not popular. And the idea of raising that age limit to, uh, to buy a gun was very popular popular. It seems that this would probably a be a politically prudent thing to do. He said that he wasn't just going to show up to talk, that he was going to be about action. And this is, as governor, the first action that he has talked about taking uh, in, the, in the coming weeks. So I would say that politically, it's probably savvy as well, David. Dan, also at the CPAC convention today, the president spoke about, he touched on immigration. He did it in his own style. <sighs> he told a story or recited a poem which he used to do on the campaign trail which frankly liberals considered to be vile but he unfolded it from his pocket and read it again who wants to hear the story about the snake and the crowd loves it uh, and again he got this energy like he did from conservative crowds during the presidential campaign and recited a poem it rhymes it basically is about a woman who invites a snake into her home because the snake is hungry and the lady helps him and then the snake bites her what are you doing and the snake says you always knew i was a snake the moral of the story is that foreigners are dangerous and that immigrants are dangerous. That's the line he decided to take and frankly the conservatives at CPAC absolutely loved it and loved him and he loved being with them today, Tom and David. David, I just wanted to listen to Dan Raviv telling me, telling the snake, <laughs> it's to be unfair. honest. It's I almost know. unfair. We probably could have played the soundbite, but it's better to hear it from Dan Raviv. <laughs> exactly. Our senior That's Washington correspondent, Dan Raviv, our senior national correspondent, Michael Schur. Thank you much. I, I, th I thought we were going into something about like the very hungry caterpillar here. I thought so maybe where this was headed, but no. Well, all right. Coming up on Crossroads after the break, as tension continue to rise on Israel's northern border with Hezbollah. The Israeli army is ramping up its defense. We'll take a closer look at how they're preparing. And in France, the Louvre Museum is on a mission to return some of the tens of thousands of artwork taken from Jews by the Nazis, but it's not a very simple task. We'll explain next. By all accounts, tensions continue to remain high on Israel's northern border, and Israeli leaders are now preparing for an all-out war with Iranian-backed Hezbollah. And Israel's defense forces are taking no chances. They are getting prepared. I-24 News senior defense correspondent Chai Ben-Ari takes a closer look. A massive Israeli army exercise was held this week in Israel's north. It comes on the backdrop of recent flare-ups with Syria and Iran and an increase in tensions with the militant Lebanese group Hezbollah. Though the exercise was pre-scheduled, the emphasis here was preparation for war that could break out at any time. One particular scenario was at the heart of the drills. I say to the holy warriors of the Islamic resistance, be prepared for a day when war is forced upon Lebanon. And the commanders of the resistance may ask you to take over the Galilee. These forces, belonging to the IDF 769th Brigade, drilled for a Hezbollah infiltration into an Israeli border community, practicing moving from building to building, gradually clearing every premises. IDF officers who spoke to I-24 News conceded that a Hezbollah infiltration is an option, but rejected the possibility of the Galilee being conquered. 
It is believed Hezbollah would be happy to capture even a small area for a limited period of time. While these operations are naturally defensive, the officers told us that the IDF would simultaneously strike back at Hezbollah in such a scenario in its own territory, using airstrikes and artillery, and perhaps even ground forces. One of the elements drilled here was the rapid call-up of entire units of reservists who would leave their civilian lives to take an active part in the fighting, including in Lebanese territory if needed. A retired senior IDF officer who played a key role in Israel's last war against Hezbollah told I-24 News that in a future conflict, Israel should seek to move its ground forces into Lebanon at an early stage. Many predict such a conflict will take a heavy toll on all sides involved. Shai ben Ari, I-24 News. You remember the Lebanese War 2006, 12 years ago? Yes, I do. There were certain days in which hundreds of missiles hit Israel's north, and now they're saying, according to people in the IDF, the, the next round will probably be between, it could be, one day between 1,500 and 2,000 wow. missiles per day. That will wow. be... Yeah. That means have, everybody goes into bomb shelters and doesn't come out. Exactly, exactly. And uh, also, you know, now with Assad in Syria gaining back control, the um, Hezbollah fighters are just get, getting freed up to building their power. Which adds the significance of Israel taking out up to, what is it, a third of the surface-to-air missile systems just a few weeks ago. That could be perhaps crucial over the long term. So. Yeah, well, a different story now. Turning now to France, there's a new exhibit at the famed Louvre Museum, but it's about more than art. It's about justice. The museum is displaying Nazi looted art in the hopes that the rightful owners will come forward. I-24 News culture correspondent Maya Margit has that story. At first, it's hard to see what all these paintings at the Louvre have in common. If you look more closely, however, you'll see that what connects them is a unique shared history. All these paintings were stolen or bought by Nazi occupiers in France during World War II. And now, more than 30 of them are on display in a special permanent exhibition. We decided to open two rooms specially dedicated to paintings found in Germany at the end of the Second World War in a bid to raise awareness about restitution efforts. It was important for us at the Louvre to emphasize that these are Nazi looted works. Our goal is to return them. It's the first time the Louvre, one of the world's most important museums, has dedicated a space to Nazi looted art. And it's part of France's growing quest to return some of the tens of thousands of artworks taken from Jews before the war and during the German occupation. But as one expert explains, restitution is anything but a simple matter. Restitution relies on research and archival materials. Sometimes it's very difficult to positively identify an artwork in a private collection, especially if it has a generic theme. So the research ultimately involves a kind of reconstruction of memory to ensure no mistakes are made in establishing a work's provenance. Still, the show is a long-awaited move that's already had some success. With France returning three paintings by the Flemish master, Joachim Patinier. This is a moment filled with hope because it marks a double victory in a war that France is continually engaged in, the battles for justice and memory. The art was handed over to Chris Bromberg and Henrietta Schubert, the descendants of a Jewish family forced to sell them as they fled the Nazis in 1938. It's the second time France has returned looted art to the family. A gratitude to society. That's the emotion I feel uh, more than the, the, the painting itself. It's a wonderful painting, but um, being connected to a work of art that belonged to my grandfather after so many years, you know, 60 years, 70 years, is, uh, is quite exciting. There's a long road ahead for France, which aims to return thousands of yet unclaimed works of art. A road they hope will ultimately lead to a victory for justice and memory. Maya Margit, I-24 News. It's an interesting step that the Louvre is trying to do. I mean, it's, it's tough it's for justice. a lot of people. It's justice. As it's justice. It's tough for a lot of people to see. Um, but it's, I mean, I think it's good that it's happening. Maybe other museums, you know, yeah. other places around the world will follow yeah. through. Uh, a lot more still ahead at the Winter Olympics. Uh, another Russian has been caught doping, or at least she failed a doping test. And by the way, the Russian who did it, she wore a T-shirt a couple weeks ago saying that she did not 
engage in doping. Come she on. got caught. As we mentioned earlier, President Trump continues to show his support for arming teachers with guns as a possible solution to school shootings. But teachers have started a new movement now. They're taking to social media to advocate what they would rather be armed with. Some would like books. Others are asking for funding and resources to help students with mental health issues or army with counselors, army with social workers to meet the emotional needs of all students. Or just arm me with more time so that I can teach life lessons and develop social skills. And some of these teachers, they just want the basics like stationery and other school supplies, but they have made it pretty clear they do not want guns. Well, you know, pr pr the president said it would be a major deterrent, but... So creative to do the hashtag army and then they fill it in. I mean, it's like yeah. everybody's trolling everybody else these days. It's remarkable. I don't know, an armed teacher against somebody who has nothing to lose and just wants to yeah. kill other people. Well, the Winter Olympics in South Korea's Pyeongchang is just about coming to a close. The Russians have swept women's figure skating and the Americans had a pretty poor showing. But the, yeah, the women on Team USA, they should be proud because in the medals race, they are beating their male counterparts. Alex Stone has the latest. On the ground here in South Korea, Ivanka Trump in the role of diplomat, having dinner with South Korean President Moon Jae-in before leading the U.S. delegation in the closing ceremony. Russia dominated the night in women's figure skating, winning gold and silver. The two skaters from Russia battling for the top spot with an almost identical score, Russia taking home its first gold of these games. The American women had their worst showing in modern era Olympic history. Finishing in 9th, 10th, and 11th places, Mariah Nagasu failed to get any lift on her triple axel. But she appeared to take the loss in stride, saying afterwards she was smiling during her performance because she was thinking of it as an audition for Dancing with the Stars. Nagasu remarked, quote, I would like to be on Dancing with the Stars because I am a star. No medals today for Team USA, but our women have been leading the way, winning five gold medals in Pyeongchang. Michaela Schifrin taking gold and silver in alpine skiing events. Hopefully I'm inspiring people, and hopefully I'm inspiring not just young girls back home, too. The women have been performing very, very well, and that's so exciting to be a part of that. The U.S. men's drought in speed skating continues as American Joey Mantia just missed the podium, finishing in fourth place. Shawnee Davis finished in seventh. And that was Alex Stone reporting. What a disappointing Olympics for Team USA. And I got to say, even for the Russians, right? Such nationalism is, and pride in Russia. But they knew going into the games that if they won any gold medals, they would have to sit there and listen to the Olympic anthem. So <laughs> they win a gold medal in women's figure skating. And? It's the best moment of this figure skater's life. And she has to go up there. No Russian flag. No Russian anthem. Okay. The Olympic anthem. That's, that's so sad. And she looks so sad. deflated. That's very sad. And it's a collective punishment. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, because, look, doping was a big scandal in Russia. And... and apparently it's still ongoing. Oh, yeah. That's right, because while the Russians may have dominated figure skating, some other Russian athletes, well, they are in hot water. A second athlete has failed a doping test. Uh, she is a bobsled pilot. Her name is Nadija Sergeyeva. She tested positive for a banned heart medication. And here's what makes it so ironic. A couple weeks ago, she gave an interview. And here's some pictures of her from where she was sort of on, on the bobsled. But there's f a photograph of her from a couple weeks ago where there she is. She's wearing oh a T-shirt. I don't do doping. I am the sport. The and she sport. did this so that everybody would like her and say, oh, she's not, she's not doped up. And she was caught. <laughs> That's crazy. She wears a T-shirt. And, and she's by the way, she, she, she's not the only one because it follows the Russian curling team having to give back their bronze medal over a doping offense. How, how does performance-enhancing drugs help you in curling? I don't know. Curling. You just like you that's, move the mouth. You really need to be. <laughs> I'm juiced sorry. Up I, I don't that. even know the rules, so I, I don't think I can weigh in on this one. Uh, curling is quite complicated, but it just. Um, you know, some some say that the um, I.O. The, the Olympic Committee right. was a bit lenient with the punishment given to Russia, and it's not a real deterrence. And then when it happens again, and now I guess the Russians cannot complain. I just I still can't get it. I mean, with curling, you just have to mop a lot, right? Do you need a performance enhancing drug? Do you need maybe it's in like the deal? water in Russia? Maybe it's just you know. Although I mean, this one apparently with, the, with the bobsled driver, she tested clean first, and then she tested positive several days later. So something happened. Something after she said, I do not dope.
Maybe it depends on what the definition Zah is. Sports. Maybe she meant, I am not a dope. <laughs> I right. don't do doping. I am the sports. <laughs> I am the sports. But I am juiced. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Spasiva. Yes. Well, that'll do it for this hour of Crossroads. <laughs> <laughs> but stay with us on I-24 News for much more. We'll be right back. I would like to apologize to all of our Russian viewers out there. I am deeply sorry.